Thank you for joining us for the second part of our traumatic brain injury series. I'm Zoe France Simone, and I'm here again with Dr. Mary McLaughlin. Our goal is to help homeless service workers, shelter employees, social service personnel, police, and others to recognize behaviors that may be indicative of a traumatic brain injury. This is often referred to as a TBI. Yes, thanks, Zoe. Given a suspected TBI, a referral should be made to a neurologist for evaluation. What often happens is when people see behavior that is unusual, um, people will send you know, the person to a psychiatrist for evaluation, but it might make more sense to send the person initially to a neurologist. So that's why we're doing these programs so people can you know, learn some screening skills. So can a person be referred directly to a neurologist or do, does he or she need to go to a primary care physician first? Uh, you need to go through a primary care doctor. Before that, uh, you'll need to arrange Medicaid health insurance for your clients. And that's usually done via county social services programs. That sounds like it could take some time. Yes, but I found that people with a long history of homelessness have sustained repeated trauma to their heads. I thought that psychiatric disorders were the most likely disability in this population. Many do have psychiatric disorders. However, I found in my own research an unexpected prevalence of brain injuries. People whose behavior may be confusing seem to be routinely referred for psychiatric treatment when a neurology consult might be the more appropriate first step. Of course, people can have several coexisting disorders, but when I see that, I start with um, the evaluation for the brain injury with a neurologist. I think it would be helpful if we shared some stories from the field like we did with our first TBI video. Good idea. Let's start with Sam. Sam was 48 years old, and I met him on my first day, the very first day of my chronic homelessness research program. My research assistant and I had been directed to a railroad bridge where homeless people gathered during the day. She was a licensed social worker with a master's degree. She, had, she worked in the area of substance use disorders. Uh, and uh, she was interested in working with me on this research project to kind of decide whether she wanted to continue in school uh, to earn a PhD, which actually she subsequently did. Now, at this location, some people slept there at night. What was Sam like? He came across to us as very pleasant and outgoing. When we arrived, he came out from underneath the bridge and approached us. He started chatting and remained there talking with us for a long time. He told us that he lived outdoors. Was there something especially noticeable about him? Yes. When he eventually left, I said to my assistant, it sounds to me like he has sustained a brain injury. And she said, how do you know that? Well, I said, we've been listening to him for about an hour and a half now. I noticed a few things. First, he told us a great deal about himself. In other words, there was a lot of oversharing to two total strangers. Um, he also mentioned that he had been a skilled craftsman working in a big warehouse and that he had fallen from a high scaffolding in that warehouse. He told us that in quote, quote unquote, his brain moved forward in that accident. Those were his exact words. In other words, he referred specifically to a catastrophic fall, which impacted his brain. Wow. Was there anything else especially noticeable? Yes. He also said that he couldn't remember how long he'd been homeless. Uh, a memory disorder is not unusual in a brain injured individual. He also said that he liked to be homeless because he just wanted to have fun and drink. Although he was 49 years old, he sounded very adolescent in his outlook, uh, which is a characteristic that I noted in other brain injured individuals. He sounds similar to the people we discussed in our previous TBI video, especially with respect to his oversharing 
his memory deficit and the adolescent character of his conversation, like you mentioned. Yes. When I asked him if he were collecting Social Security disability income, he replied, no, because it's too complicated. The application process had presented an insurmountable challenge to him. He also spoke about how much he enjoyed drinking. People with brain injuries often develop substance use disorders. One reason for this is that they sometimes or they may find it difficult to tolerate the confusion uh, or what we call cognitive dissonance that they sometimes experience. Can you tell us a little more about cognitive dissonance? Yes, it's basically about the internal stress and mental conflict that occur when our beliefs don't line up with our actions. In order to relieve the stress generated by this disconnect, people may self-medicate. For example, Sam was a highly skilled employee before his accident, but afterwards, when he'd been living in a homeless shelter, he returned one evening with a few cans of beer, uh, which he didn't do much to conceal. Now, this was against the rules and would certainly be noticed, and it was noticed, and as a result, he was evicted from the shelter. This sounds like an example of the misjudgment that may characterize brain-injured individuals. Yes, one of the reasons why I've continued so long in this field is because Sam was found dead just one month after we met him. This charming, disabled, homeless man was fi found lying face down in a stream after being missing for three days. Wow, that must have been heartbreaking to hear. It was. His death was what first brought my attention to the high death rate among chronically homeless people. He had appeared to us to be very physically strong and healthy. Uh, but when I learned that he'd been found dead, you know, so soon after we met with him, I was shocked. I felt sad because I felt that Sam might not have died if his disability had been properly identified and certain housing accommodations offered to him as mandated by federal laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act. Instead, he'd been evicted from the shelter basically for non-compliance, and he was living outdoors when he died. How old was he when he died? 48. Homeless people die on average 30 years younger than housed people. That sounds like a very significant loss of longevity. It is. It, it's a tragic loss of life, and deaths often occur outdoors in gruesome conditions like Sam's. And what's interesting is the death rate is pretty equal across the 12 months. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a lot of variation in our weather here. We have beautiful summers and severe winters, and the death rate seems to not be affected too much by the weather. In fact, Sam was found dead in, on a beautiful summer day. It seems like homeless service personnel need to be more aware of disabling conditions. Yes, uh, and, and I hope that we can help them with a series of videos like this one. Well, Zoe, viewers should know that you built this website several years ago when you were still in high school. Um, Zoe continues to administer it and uh, is entering her junior year in college now. Thank you, Zoe, for all that you do to help homeless people. Please watch for more of our videos on this and related topics. You can also visit our website at drmarymclaughlin.com for additional information on this subject and more.